I'm not sure if this is real or not, but I saw a thread with this guy's email, and so I sent him an email. I was hoping someone could maybe listen and help me figure it out. I know this could be fake, and I know it's a long read, so here is a TLDR. TLDR. Guy claims to have stumbled on some evil shit when investigating a murder that had occult symbols around, and now the police and others are mocking him about it. Re for Chan Lake. This is what happened. On March 9th, 2019, while investigating the location where a homeless, mentally handicapped teenage girl was assaulted and found murdered, with the police subsequently covering it up, I noticed her body was surrounded by strange occult symbols. I was friends with her cousin, and the police had attempted to blame him for her murder, but he had been in the hospital, and their plan to pin it on him had fallen apart. He told me she had been sacrificed to Satan. Quite the skeptic at this time, I did not believe the supernatural aspects of the incident, but I knew something was not right, as I had been hearing rumors on the street that she had been gang assaulted by a group of gang members called the Hell's Gods, who had recently come into our city from Cleveland, OH, and had rapidly taken over the drug and sex trade and expanded it to the point where every street was now littered with dirty needles. My grandfather had been a homicide detective, and my upbringing was one that gave me a strong sense of justice, and I felt like this poor girl deserved better. She had been murdered in an abandoned paper mill that the city refused to tear down, even though it was a haven for junkies and other social parasites. Her naked body was found in early winter, naked, and pushed down a 30-foot deep pit. The police marked it as death by exposure, and no further investigations were conducted. I had attempted to call attention to the fact that she had been naked and through my investigations determinations had been last seen at McDonald's getting into the car of a young black man, one of whom who was supposedly the supervisor of a local homeless shelter that was known for being a haven of drugs and debauchery. After her murder, this man disappeared. The pit where her body was found was surrounded by a number of extremely strange symbols. I recognized a couple of them from Masonic heraldry and photographed them all. Something was off here. I returned home and intended on uploading the photos and learning more about them on various occult forums. An acquaintance of mine and a female that was far too attractive for him randomly showed up at my apartment and we had a few drinks. They left and I noticed that my phone was gone. A few days later, the same girl approached me on the street, seemingly at random, and told me she had mistakenly taken my phone and gave it back. All the photos of the site were deleted, along with all my notes I had taken about the murder and certain research into esoteric organizations that I had collected over the last few years. I went back to the site with a black friend of mine, who I later found out is a Prince Hall Mason and a member of the very same gang known as the Hell Gods to photograph the symbols. Someone had gone into the building and scrubbed off all of the graffiti. Who goes into an abandoned building and cleans off the graffiti where a girl was killed just a few weeks prior? None of the other graffiti was ever touched. The friend told me that we should leave and I should just drop this. On the way out, I felt something. It was like something I had never felt before. It was like my entire body had become electrified all of a sudden, and I bloated out, in two weeks time, I will see the enemy of mankind in this very spot. I had never had anything like this happen to me before, and I had no idea why I had said this. It was like something had taken over my body. Two weeks later, I was returning from the bar after having had a few beers and dinner, and was on my way to my apartment when I decided to take a shortcut which went near to the abandoned building where the girl had been killed. I had not been thinking about the odd outburst that I had, and was only interested in getting back home, as it was a chilly March night, and I had to work in the morning. As I came to the building, a giant red eye appeared in the sky behind me. I have never seen anything like this in my life. It looked like the Eye of Sauron from the Lord of the Rings movie. Side note. If you look into the origin of the word Sauron, it is derivative of the word Satan, our source of the word Satan. I considered that I had had too much to drink and kept walking, believing I had mistaken some sort of light 
for something that could not possibly ever exist. Then a 30-foot tall set of ancient hermetic scales appears out of freaking thin air, not even 10 feet in front of me, and telepathically says, I am a watcher. At this point, I am convinced I must have been drugged at the bar, hit my head, and had a concussion, or had simply lost my mind as it was absolutely impossible for this thing to be right there in front of me, close enough to touch if I could move from the spot where I had been frozen in fear by it. Adjacent to this entity was a smaller one that looked a lot like a droid from Star Wars floating three or so feet off the ground and moving back and forth like it was patrolling the area. I did not know what to do, so I ran into the abandoned building adjacent to the one where the girl had been murdered and stumbled into the entrance to a series of underground tunnels. I had no idea what was happening at this point and was frantically seeking an exit as I thought I was about to be abducted by robot aliens. I am a pretty normal guy that used to think David Icke was something of a loon. I do not believe that at all at this point. The man is either part of the conspiracy or one of the only ones on the planet that is actually in a position to prevent what is coming. While seeking the exit, I came around a corner, and there, maybe 30 feet in front of me, stood a 10 plus foot tall, white skinned giant, with long flowing white hair down to his shoulders, wearing a green coat, and standing motionless as it stared at me with massive, glossy eyes. I thought it was a statue, until a voice in my head said, this is the only time you will see me face to face. It reminded me of the Solomon Grundy character from the old Super Friends cartoon, but real. I had no freaking idea what I was seeing at this time, as I had not done much research into the Nephilim. I stood for a few minutes, staring at this monster, and took off running, and came to an exit that led outside. Terrified, I believed I was about to be eaten by something out of a Grimm's fairy tale or horror movie, and smashed through the boarded up window of a building across the street only to come into the middle of a satanic rite, being performed where half a dozen people came up to me, talking in tongues, enchanting, and began laying hands on me, while others rolled around on the floor like mad men and women. Within minutes, a police officer shows up and says, we have been expecting you, Jason, and I was charged with trespassing because this was not an abandoned building, even though it had the windows all boarded up. It was a Pentecostal church. This was Saturday night, Saturn Day, by the way, at around 3am. There should not have been anyone in this building at all, let alone 20 people rolling around like lunatics and speaking in tongues. I was then taken to jail, where I told the intake officer that I was having chest pains and needed to go to the hospital, as I feared I had injured myself in a fall and had concussion or some other serious medical issue, and that everything I had seen was the result of that, because clearly, giants are not real. They took me to a hospital that I have been treated at dozens of times over the 20 years I have lived in this city, to a ward I had never seen before. There, surrounded by police officers and medical personnel, I was forced to watch a homeless man be castrated while both staff and police made jokes about using penises for black magic, assaulting children, taking over the world, and how mankind is too stupid to notice and too weak to stop them. I was dumbstruck. There is a lot more to this, but I typically am just told that I am mentally ill when I try to recite it, or if someone does believe me. It is typically because they are a member in a certain fraternal organization that worships the Nephilim. Things are about to change, and not for the better, and no one listens to me. Post that shit on social media, and watch your account magically end up banned. I was recruited to help fix a device constructed by a non-human intelligence. These beings utilized this device to create stars. They had mastered all science involving manipulation of space-time, but something was wrong with their star creation device. Earth was the planet closest to them, with sentient beings, so they came here and worked their way through our population, trying to determine which individuals could successfully assist with repairing the device if given all of the necessary information. If they found individuals that could not contribute, they'd just revert to before they selected that individual, 
and then select another one, and then try again. Three humans were ultimately selected for this process that resulted in a successful repair of the device. Myself, Michio Kaku, and Dr. Stephen Greer. After their part in repairing the device, Greer and Kaku both had their memories wiped clean of the event. I was allowed to retain specific memories involving this project due to aid that I had rendered to one of the beings. Greer was upset that they would not be able to disclose any information about the event to the general public. He became very heated and nearly had a physical altercation with one of the beings. I stood between them and tried to end the conflict. This was one of the reasons I was allowed to retain memory. In truth, I would not have been able to contribute at all if they had not directly manipulated our timeline in an effort to ensure I would ultimately be able to help them. They altered my entire life, from the moment of my birth near White Sands Missile Base to my scientific and mathematic acumen that resulted in me attending one of the top schools in the world for these subjects. The event in which I helped these beings took place when I was 26 years old. They are the originators of the metal orb UAPs that have been spotted around Earth. They have been altering key details of our timeline since 1947. The Mandela Effect contains key details that our AGI in the future will be able to decode our access key to the largest intercivilization information network in the universe. Yes, Mandela Effect is happening. In order to get our Earth internet hooked up to a wider information network in use by multiple other civilizations. The internet of intergalactic proportions. When we decode how to interpret the packets which are dispersed through artificial star manipulation, then data will begin pouring in faster than we can ever hope to store it. Until we begin a local session with the closest civilization to Earth, they will provide our initiation packet. This will include all necessary technological advancement and specification to get us up to acceptable modulation speeds to interact in real time with that network. All of this will be for an interdimensional gain of function project. One spin-off project and repository is known as Blue Eisenhower November. Once AGI and the rest of humanity are capable of understanding Blue Eisenhower November and how it works, this can be utilized for the benefit of all possible life within this universe. One constraint we will find when attempting backwards time travel on baryonic matter is that the gravitational effects of the matter must be sent back in time twice as far as the matter itself is sent back in time. This method curtails a quantum paradox situation and fully takes advantage of something akin to loop quantum gravity. This is the reason for dark matter, dark energy, and its effects on the observable universe. That's right, in order to send matter back in time, you must send that matter's gravitational field effects back in time twice as far back as we send the matter itself. This will be proven in the coming decades. We live an intent-based existence, and when humanity finally learns the real cause of gravity, the necessity for all human events will become clear. I think I was MK Ultra for real. This is something that happened to me in 2009. I tend to forget about it for months or years at a time, but every so often the memory comes floating back. This is only the second time I have ever written it out. Be me. Be in Minnesota suburb. Go to the mall one day. Sitting in the food court all by myself. Guy comes up to me with a clipboard. Offers me $15 to take a survey. Why not? He leads me to an employee's only entrance. Inside is an office with a small reception area and another room where I can see people at computer stations. Lady at the desk has me sign a stack of paperwork. Tons of fine print, half to initial in different places. All of this seems rather elaborate for a $15 survey. I am struggling to feel unsettled, but also intrigued. They take me into the computer room. I have to take a survey about my demographics and consumer preferences. Pretty basic stuff. See pictures of fake products on shelves. Click on the products that appeal to me. Then it's time for part two. This is where shit gets weird. Woman takes me down a hallway into a small room. 
There is literally nothing in the room but a chair, a large projector screen, and a table with a laptop in the corner. Woman stands at the laptop and turns out the lights. The room is now pitch black, except for a single white dot on the projector screen. I am supposed to follow the dot with my eyes. Woman tells me to relax, breathe, and focus only on her voice. I am literally being hypnotized by a stranger in a shitty back office at the mall. Now a grid of nine squares comes on the screen, each one numbered. She says to focus on the nine, focus on the nine, do not look at any of her numbers. She repeats this process with each number in a random order. At this point, my memory goes blank. I do remember seeing another CGI image of store shelves with various products, but I don't remember how long it took or what else I had to do. I believe I was calling out numbers also. Finally, the survey is over. I get my $15 and walk out wondering what the fuck just happened. Well, Lex, it has been over 10 years, but do I have anything to worry about? Years later, I told this story to a friend of mine. He did some research and found that a company named Heakin Research did market research in this mall. The website no longer appears to be active, but it is archived and shows that they operate it all over the United States. Sure thing. So the related guy in question is in charge of a small but talented PMC. And long story short, he was indebted to the organization, formerly known as Blackwater, and has to accept contracts from them until it is repaid, which mostly consisted of holding seemingly inconsequential yet possibly haunted areas of forest in northern Ukraine somewhere. This was holding strong points while shock troops, aka cannon fodder, pushes into contested territory and going on the occasional patrol and even rarer, mounting strikes against enemy strong points. Before this happened, there was a push on a strong point and as soon as it was secured, Blackwater moved in excavation equipment immediately and was giving off vibes that people might get silenced just for being there. So the PMC made like a tray and got the fuck out of there. Luckily, nobody came for them. Later on, either a patrol or on a push, they stumbled on a similar facility that the enemy fought tooth and nail to defend. Once cleared, underneath, they found some sort of containment unit consisting of at least a foot thick of metal 20 odd foot cube and the only opening was a tank, feeding in some sort of fluid that on the hazard card was like a 979. Someone had scratched on the side of the unit, in Russian, giant sentient banana. Something was pounding from the inside of the walls, hard enough to shake half the room. This facility looked like it had not been used in 30 odd years, by the way. The group had the containment unit and tank of unknown hazardous shit relocated to an untold facility, probably in a desert somewhere, and to my knowledge, has not been opened. One anon link to a Mexican website about the connection between the drug cartel and the Palo Mayombe cult. I went ahead and translated it. My Spanish is rusty, but it's way better than Google Translate, apparently. A gang operating out of the Santa Elena Ranch in Matamoros, Mexico, right on the border with Texas, used to transport a ton of marijuana every week into the United States. However, they were more than merely drug distributors. In 1989, this gang was accused of murdering people in gruesome rituals characteristic of the Palo Mayombe cult. The satanic narcos had turned the Santa Elena Ranch into a real-life house of horrors. On April 9th, 1989, Police pulled over a van for speeding on the Metamoros Reynosa Highway near the Santa Elena Ranch. They wound up detaining the driver. One David Cerna Valdez, aged 22 years old, after discovering marijuana and a 38 caliber pistol in the van. After hours of police questioning, the young men finally broke down and confessed that he belonged to a religious sect that practiced black magic. This confession surprise police. They went back to search the Santa Elena Ranch, where they discovered 110 kilos of marijuana and something even more macabre. Outside the house was a mass grave 
containing twelve dismembered corpses whose hearts and brains had all been removed. Even stranger, these murders seemed to be a part of some obscene ritual, evidenced by an iron cauldron that gave off a foul stench. Police examined it and found that it contained red blood, a human brain, cigarette butts, forty empty bottles of brandy, machetes, garlic, and a roasted turtle. One of the corpses was later identified as Mark Kilroy, a medical student who disappeared in March 1989. Both of his legs had been amputated and his brain had been removed. The group leader of the gang had turned a piece of his spine into a pin, which he wore in his tie as an amulet. Okay, let's do this. I never wrote about this before. In the village where I lived as a child, strange things happened that my mother told me about many years later. When I was about seven years old, my parents, my grandparents and I, lived in the same house. There was a guest house in the neighborhood that belonged to my grandmother's sister, so the story was passed on and is still well remembered by me today. It was sometime in the summer when, in addition to the usual guests, an elderly man also rented a room in the inn. This man was quite thin and checked in as Mr. Hayes. He stayed there for about three weeks until he was asked to leave the inn, and during that time, very strange things happened. It started with the fact that the man almost never left his room. The first three nights, he stayed locked in the room and did not make any noise. It was on the second night that my grandmother's sister's daughter came crying to her and said that she did not want to sleep in a room anymore. She asked her why, and she said that a man comes to visit her every night and scares her. In the following night, the mother made sure that her daughter's room was locked, but the visits did not stop. After about a week, Mr. Hayes visited my mother. He did not know that my mother was my grandmother's daughter, that is, my grandmother's sister's sister, nor that we lived here. Since my mother had always been a very open and curious person, she talked to him almost every day that week. He told her the strangest stories, and in retrospect, I'm pretty sure that he entered the locked room by a means of astral projection to save his daughter from some mischief. He told my mother that the time would come soon, and name the exact time and place when the visitors, as he called them, would come and visit. They would help her with her experiences she had as a kid, like talking to dead people. When we should be there, they will tell us everything that we need to know. A few days later, he was expelled from the house by my grandmother's sister because the daughter was panic-stricken by him. My mother never had another chance to talk to him, and we never saw him again. She told me years later that I also met Mr. Hayes, but hid under my bed every time he came. Apparently, I was so panicked by him, but I have absolutely no recollection of it. My father was in the U.S. Army and stationed in Germany at the time, and he went into the woods on the day Mr. Hayes told us. He said that there was something there, but that every cell in his body would have resisted entering the place. He talked about it exactly once, and would not tell us anything more about it after that. Well, I think aliens came visiting us this night, and I wish I had been there. Why does something like this happen when I was a little kid? It is my absolute dream to find the truth out there, and this was my chance. This story is true, and writing it gave me goosebumps. Be me, around 16 years old, living in rural Colorado, essentially in the Rocky Mountains. Dad loves to backpack and hike, and I have been hiking since I was one years old. We are both into paranormal stuff. He says he has seen Gur several times, and potentially even Bigfoot. I, more skeptical, fascinated by Bigfoot stuff but mostly from a thought experiment sort of standpoint. We decided to go backpacking during fall break at this trail pretty far from where we live. The place is beautiful, lots of ponderosa and aspen. One landmark of the trail we're about to do is a section that covers 1,000 plus feet of elevation in like a super short area using a fuck ton of switchbacks. Luckily, we were going to be going down the trail rather than the other direction. We see a small party of hikers when we first start the trail, 
but for the next three days, we see absolutely no one. We barely saw any wildlife or anything, only a deer, a bat, and the occasional squirrel. Our second night, we decided to camp by the river. The area we set up in is this relatively narrow slot canyon, but not straight up or vertical. On one side, there is this pile of rocks and gravel covering a part of the mountainside. There were some massive boulders around that indicated that huge chunks of the cliff face had broken up before. It was a little sketch, but overall seemed safe. Still confused how we had not seen a single person since that first part of the trail. At around 2 to 4 in the morning, still dark out, we hear an extremely loud crashing noise roughly 50 meters back up the trail in the direction that we came from. It sounded something like several cymbals being clanged together, the sprinkling sound of a firework, and the pure thump of an extremely heavy object hitting dirt. We both wake up after hearing it, and we get out for a bit to make sure nothing fucked up is happening. Nothing happens, so we head back to sleep. The next morning, we walk a good 500 meters in both directions, following the trail to see if a boulder had fallen into the water or something. We find nothing. There is no broken branches, torn up dirt, nothing. I am not saying this was Bigfoot or anything. All I am saying is, I have no clue what it could have been. We are both a little creeped out, due to how bizarre it was. But overall, we were not scared for our lives or anything crazy like that. We decide to haul ass on the third day and walk an extra mile or two at the end of the trail. Still have no idea what it could have been. I suppose it could have been a boulder, but we probably would have heard it coming down the mountain or found the new boulder. Only way I can explain this encounter. It happened two weeks ago. Be me. Train hopper. Caught a freight train from Jacksonville, Florida. Was gonna ride it in Birmingham. Instead got caught in the rain in Jacksonville. Had low supplies, so we had to bail at the next crew change, which was Manchester, Georgia. A small, small town in the middle of the forest in east central Georgia. Get off the train and notice that it's quiet. Too quiet. The town itself has an eerie feeling to it. Most of the buildings were abandoned, and it was like a ghost town you would find in New Mexico, but in central Georgia. Go to the only store in town, a Dollar General, and get supplies and some beer. Head back to the hopout, which is about two miles down the RR tracks into the woods, with a semi-steep grid of ballast to work on. We made it to a small clearing of woods that isn't up a fucking hill. Only one house nearby. We roll out and camp to catch up on sleep. Figure we catch a train the next day. Wake up in the middle of the night to a disturbing howl. It was way too loud to be a coyote and sound deep, almost like an ape. Then it stopped. Woke up the next morning to find my dog cowered in a bush, scared out of her mind. I figured it might have been a bear. There are black bears here, even though bears do not fucking howl like that. So we pack up and wait for a train, any train at all. Five hours later, a junk train pulls up. We start walking down the tracks. No rideable cars, no porches, just crossbeams. We walk the entire length of the train, hoping to find something rideable. Anything. Nothing. Train airs up and leaves. We sit, four miles from town down the tracks into the woods. Night falls. Fall asleep. Wake up to howling again. This time my dog starts to whimper. Usually she is aggressive and is fearless. She even tried to kill a gator in Florida, but she was crying. I hear pounding and the howl get louder. I wake my road dog up. I try to turn on my phone, but it is dead. So we get up, pack up, and start running to the town. I hear branches break. A train pulls up. Fucking finally. Perfect time. As the train passes and slows down, a fucking tree trunk lands on the ground in front of us. It was as if something threw it at us. We hear gunshots, like that of a rifle, and someone is shouting in a really thick southern drawl. Get the fuck out away from my house, you big fucking ape. You won't kill me like you did my guts. Four gunshots. The train stops. My road dog and I look at each other and bolt for a DPU. An unmanned locomotive, usually mid-train, and get on. 
We lock the nose door. Then we hear something on the ballast. The grid is narrow for vehicles to drive down, but it sounded like a truck, the crunching of the rocks. We hear a loud thud on the nose door. Something was outside the DPU. The train airs and starts moving. The sound stops. As our train approaches the town, we both saw a big motherfucking figure jump off into the trees. I am talking massive, like the size of a moose, but Georgia does not have mooses. This happened two weeks ago. I couldn't figure out what in the fuck we saw. Until I researched and came across Bigfoot sightings in Georgia. Then I listened to audio of Bigfoot. Sure as shit, that was exactly what the fuck we both heard. Why oh why was my stupid phone dead? Really wish I could have recorded that shit. I don't care if you believe me or not. I know what the fuck we saw and heard. I was a skeptic. Now I am certain. Bigfoot is fucking real. I am getting goosebumps just writing this X. What does X know about Bigfoot or cryptids in Georgia? Mainly, Manchester, Georgia.